Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. My name's Matt. Today we're going to take a look at an early American jet interceptor, the Northrop F-89 Scorpion. To put the F-89 into some context, its development began in 1948. It was intended to be an all-weather interceptor. Its stablemates included the F-86 Sabre and the F-84 Thunderjet. The F-89 made its first flight in August 1948 and entered service two years later. In August 1945, the US Army Air Force released a specification for a new jet-powered night fighter capable of speeds up to 530 miles per hour. Jack Northrop began work on a swept wing design, which went on to be evaluated alongside entries from Bell Aircraft, Consolidated Volte, Douglas Aircraft, Goodyear, and Curtis Wright. The US Army Air Force down-selected Northrop's design, then known as the N-24, and the Curtis Wright XP-87 Blackhawk. The XB-87 seen here was a slightly larger, slightly heavier aircraft, with its two-man crew seated side by side. It was powered by two Westinghouse XJ-34 WE-7 turbojet engines mounted on the wings. In comparison, the Northrop design was slimmer, with swept wings, and had two Allison J-35 engines buried low in its fuselage to reduce drag. The N-24 was designated the XP-89 by the US Army Air Force, and a full-scale model was ordered. Aerodynamic testing found that the swept wing was unstable in low-speed flight, and a straight, narrow profile was developed, and the horizontal stabiliser and cockpit configuration was redesigned. In 1948, the newly formed US Air Force redesignated fighters from P to F, and the XP-89 became the XF-89 when prototypes were ordered. During subsequent flight evaluations, the XF-89 was found to be faster than both the XF-87 and the US Navy's XF-3D. Some evaluators disliked the Northrop and criticised its cockpit layout. However, the US Air Force moved forward with its development and scrapped the XF-87. Testing with a second prototype continued and the engines were upgraded with a more powerful Allison J33A21 being fitted with an afterburner. While concerns about the ease of maintenance were answered by having the whole engine capable of lowering out of the fuselage. The XF-89 suffered a number of crashes during testing, with a fatal crash on the 22nd of February 1950, which killed the test flight engineer Arthur Turton, when flutter or vibrations in the elevator caused the tail of the aircraft to shear off. The geometry of the rear fuselage and the engine exhaust were found to be the cause and were redesigned. Here we have some great footage of one of the initial test flights of the XF-89, courtesy of the San Diego Air and Space Museum, which digitised footage from the Greater St. Louis Air and Space Museum's Gerald Blazer collection. We get to see the aircraft taxi, take off, in flight and land. Production of the XF-89 was greenlit in January 1949, with a contract for 48 F-89s worth just over 39 million, awarded several months later in May. The F-89's armament varied considerably during its service life. Originally it had been intended for the night fighters to have a turret with four forward firing cannons, with another two cannon turret firing aft. This was abandoned and the first F-89As had six forward-firing 20mm cannons and the ability to mount rocket pods carrying 16 5-inch rockets. The F-89A was quickly superseded by the B, which had the same armament but with improved avionics. The F-89D entered service in October 1954. 
The D abandoned the cannons and instead had two rocket pods, mounting a total of 104 smaller 2.75 inch Mighty Mouse Mark IV folding fin aerial rockets. Entering service in 1956, the F-89H, equipped with large wingtip pods, which could each externally carry three Falcon missiles and a further 21 Mighty Mouse rockets internally. Delays refining the Hughes' E-9 fire control system meant that by the time the H entered service, it was outclassed by newer, faster supersonic fighters, like the F-100 Super Sabre, F-101 Voodoo, and interceptors like the F-102 Delta Dagger and the F-105 Starfighter. The F-89J, introduced in 1957, retrofitted the F-89D with underwing hardpoints for two MB-1 Jenny nuclear-armed rockets and four Falcon missiles. 350 Js were converted from F-89Ds, and the F-89J has the distinction of being the only aircraft to fire a live MB-1 air-to-air nuclear rocket. During the Operation Plumbob tests in July 1957, The MB-1 was an air-to-air -air rocket with a 6-mile range and a 1.5 kiloton W-25 nuclear warhead. It was ostensibly a tactical nuclear weapon designed to take on Soviet strategic bomber formations. The US Air Force began to retire the F-89H in 1959 as more supersonic interceptors entered service and the refitted Js also began to be replaced around the same time but some would remain in service with the Air National Guard for another decade. The F-89 is definitely a striking aircraft very much of its time. A substantial number were built, around 1,050 in total, but they remain one of the lesser known early Cold War jets. The F-89 we've been looking at today is an F-89H and is on display at the Hill Aerospace Museum in Utah. Thanks for watching guys, I know these aviation videos are something a little bit different for the channel, but I hope you're enjoying them. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so via Patreon, or with a one-time donation via Coffee.com. And of course, another great way of supporting the channel is to share the videos with friends. Thanks again for watching, see you in the next one.